Mary, and welcome to another episode of the Influential Nonprofit. I work with nonprofit leaders to master the art of influence to grow their influential leadership so they can build communities, communities of support and move their missions. People just like you who learn how to leverage relationships, to enroll people into a vision and to move people to action and an action they choose to do. They don't have to do it. They don't need to do it. They choose to do it. They get to do it. They're excited to do it. That is when you become truly influential. And when you are that, life is just like a super highway of energy and joy and support and income coming towards you. And you can have that. And that's what I do with people I coach and train. If you're interested in talking to me more about that, I'm happy to talk with you. I am building an assessment tool, an influence assessment, and it's almost complete. As soon as it's complete, I will let you know. You can take it, book a call with me. We can walk through your results, talk about how influential you are and where you could build up your skill set. Today, I want to talk about something I don't think we talk about enough. You know, it's a new year. And in the new year, we tend to focus on our fundraising goals and focus on money. You know, what we want to do with money, both personally and professionally, how much we want to raise, where we want to budget it, how we want to spend it. Also, in our own life, what are our financial goals for the year? And in fundraising, we get a lot of strategy. Do this, say this, talk to them like this. If you approach them like this, it'll work. How do I, here's how you ask. He da 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 We... It's all about the strategy. What I don't see us talking about a lot, which I would love to have this conversation with you today, is how our thoughts and feelings about money, our money mindset, plays into our ability to raise money. You know, money is a super, super charged topic. It, it comes with a lot of feelings. Of, you know, we have a lot of guilt, shame, anxiety around money. We have resentment towards money. Um. We have a, we either, we resent it, people who have it, but we wish we had it. You know, all, all there, it, it, it's a lot of these things. And all of this combines to sometimes cause barriers to asking for money because you may not understand how your thoughts and feelings are making it harder for you to ask for what you need. No, like think about the stories we tell ourselves about money. Money is the root of all evil, right? Um, that, you know, um, money changes everything. You know, money, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of stories and I'm sure you have their, so, you know, the sayings around money and that we, we believe those. You know? um, if you have a resentment towards money or towards wealthy people, it may make it difficult for you to connect with people who are wealthy and ask them for money, which will make fundraising a little bit more complicated. You know, many years ago, I, I had a client who who uh, ran a small nonprofit and went to a benefit for a much larger nonprofit. And he was overwhelmed with the money in the room. And he's like, I just don't, I don't know the kind of people who could throw down $5,000 a night. Those aren't my people. And I'm like, okay, so let's let's look at the story that you're telling yourself and the triggers and the feelings are coming up when you're in a situation like that. Because those energetic barriers, those energetic barriers will cause you to not connect with the people who may be able to support you. You know, we are an inside out job, okay? So we say, oh, if I raise this much or if I do this, I'll feel good. When actually it's the opposite. It's like, oh, if I feel like a confident fundraiser, I will. You know, I when I feel good about money and the role it plays in my life and the role it plays in my organization's life, I will be able to ask more of it to raise it. And so remember, but most of our fundraising training is from the outside in. It's all about strategy. Do this, do that. We don't talk about how the thoughts and feelings really contribute. So we're going to unpack that today and, and we're going to talk about it. Um, as always, I love comments, questions. You can always feel free to email me, book a time with me. Let, let's talk about some of the stuff. Let's move through the barriers, whatever you think is getting in your way. I had to do my own work with money. You know, I still, I'm, it's, it's an evolving thing. Um, it, it's, it's an evolving skill, right? It's a practice. 
Um, your relationship with money, it's always in practice. Well, let me give you a definition. Money mindset is your unique and individual set of core beliefs about money and how money works in the world. It is your basic attitude towards money. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, I was in Chicago coaching a group of, of board members and executive directors from all over the Chicago land area, okay? This is pre-COVID, right before COVID. Crazy project, because anyway, I was working with a board president and we were talking about money mindset and she said that she and her executive director butt heads around money. And the next, the question that I asked, the first question I asked shocked her. I said, tell me about your childhood. And she was like, what? Tell me about your childhood. How, what was the role of money in your childhood? And she said, and I'll never forget this, that I can remember, I'm in that conference room right now. She said, my mother was a single mother and she was a saver. She worked and she saved and she saved for a better future for me. She saved that we could have a better home. I could go to college. And that is my, I am a, I'm the same way. I'm a saver. And that's one of the things that she, she was a board member, but her business was like helping. Um, she was like an investment person, uh, helping people grow their economic security. So key to her money mindset is security. What I want from money is to help me feel secure and to help, you know, and, and to prepare me for a secure future. Executive director, why were they fighting? Because the executive director's mindset, now I didn't know this person, but I can guess what she said. He was sort of a break-even guy. The money will come fly by the seat of your pants. And she always wanted to like endowment, you know, security. And he was like, we got this, you know, it's all good. And guess what? It was all good, which like frustrated her. So we have a person now, they're fighting. He's he's going like, he's doing the break even thing. We're making it up as we go. We'll figure it out. It always works out. He has a lot of faith and trust in, in the world. But she sees that as recklessness. He sees that as faith and trust in the world. I think that's, that's what I'm assuming. In my mind, this is what's happening. And so if you look at these two things now, they're fighting about the budget. But what they're really fighting about is their childhood money mindset. And because for him to fly by the seat of his pants really triggered her feelings of economic insecurity, which she was working so hard to overcome, okay? Um, and, you know, he was like, I don't understand why you're so, you know, consumed with the future. The present is where it's at. Here's where we need our resources to go. We need people who need this now. So you can see, but well, once you step back, he's like, whoa, what, what, what am I really talking about here? What's really happening? And look at yourself. And this is what an influential leader does. We can look at ourselves from like the 10,000 foot view with neutrality, without judgment and say, hmm, isn't that interesting? That, co that conversation really triggered me. What's going on with my money mindset? Let me unpack that a little bit. So it's your unique and individual set of core beliefs about money, how you think and feel about money. We all have our own money story. Uh, so we ought, that has been deeply ingrained with, into us since childhood. And we will continue to rewrite that money story until we consciously try to change it. You've ever heard of people who they win the lottery and within two years, they, uh, you know, they've spent everything. There is a, a, a term called, you have a wealth set point. You have a point in your life where you feel comfortable with that much money. You feel worthy of that much money. And if you go over that wealth set point, you will then subconsciously without even understanding it. And I know this seems so crazy. And you say to yourself, Miriam, if I would ever won the lottery, I'd be so responsible. Yes. Uh, yes. We're going to, we're going to, yes. And our subconscious is a very, very powerful tool and can make us make decisions because we're on autopilot and unless we develop some self-awareness and some consciousness around why we do what we do, we may spend all that money and then wake up and be like, whoa, what just happened? And it's because subconsciously you were not comfortable with money. One of my first mentors in my business was a very, very wealthy man who grew up very poor, very poor. Like, had a hose on the outside of the trailer, which is where they took showers, you know, uh, 
poor and did not have running water inside the trailer. Um, and he grew up to amass millions and millions of dollars, if not almost billions. When he first started to make money, he was just this person that was just a natural money maker. Like everything he touched, he could figure out a way to monetize it. And he amassed a lot of money and then he would spend it. You know, I said, what did you spend it on? He's like, Adam, trucks, equipment, just stuff, you know? And then I'd be gone and I'd go bankrupt and then I'd go make a million and I'd go bankrupt. And I did that a couple of times and I thought, what is going on? Well, he remembered when his mother, you know, would be sitting at the kitchen table trying to figure out how to pay bills. She said, rich people are selfish. And he was taught that rich people are selfish. So anytime he amassed money subconsciously, he wasn't comfortable with it and he would spend it. And until he figured that story out and rewrote a story, he would be continuing in that cycle. And here's the thing. We're going to talk about money. We're talking about money. I, I, want, to, I want us to separate the guilt and shame. This is pre-programmed stuff that's just inside us. And just see if we can't look at our stories with more neutrality, without judgment. Why did I do that? What did I do? It just like, let, let's just open it up and, and, and just look at it neutrally. Isn't that interesting? Okay, that happened. Because the thing is, how we shift it is to understand how our brain works. And our brain works because we want to make it work for us, not work against us. But we are hardwired evolutionary for fear. We are hardwired for fear. And that's because many, many, you know, thousands of years ago, the world was a much more dangerous place. Okay. Your chances of living throughout the day were much less than they are now. That was just, that's just, that was just how, how the world went. Our survival of, you know, of, of illness, of, you know, of, of violence or whatever, um, that was greatly. And so our brains are hardwired for fear. So they're in, always in protection mode. And so our brains around money are going to be like, Let's, oh, I have to keep it. Da, 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 da. Um, and our brain's programming and our brain, our, the, the subconscious is the biggest part of our brain. Our subconscious is what we call the autoconscious. It doesn't think it just does. And that's some people say 70 to 95% of our brain is on flipping autopilot. It is being controlled by the thoughts and feelings that are deeply programmed to into it from our childhood. So honestly, adults who really aren't unpacking their stuff and doing the work and becoming more conscious are just children in adult, in adult bodies, <laughs> children in adult bodies that who, who, are, who are acting with because of the thoughts and feelings and the belief systems that were ingrained in them as children. And so in the case of the ED and the board president, that conflict was got charged because of the triggers that they got from their childhood. So if they could step back and say, okay, I value saving. You, you know, you value the being able to make it up as you go and, and making the magic in the moment. Neither one is right or wrong. It's just how we see the world. So what, 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 and remember, um, um, a couple of weeks ago I did about polarity and moving on polarity. This is the perfect way to move beyond polarity. It's not spend or save. What, what's, what's this, what's the third way? What's the influential way, you know, that's on the other side of that, where it doesn't have to be one or the other, but remember that our money mindset is driving our relationship to money at all times. And unless we consciously change it, we were going to be lived by it. In, in our fundraising world, we don't ever talk about what our relationship to money is. How do we think and feel about money? How do we think and feel about wealth, about rich people, about poor people, about you know people who have money, people who don't have money? Um, there are a lot of beliefs that are ingrained in us from our childhood. And once we sort of inventory those, we can switch to them. I'm going to share my money story with you because, you know, I, I'm going to, good leaders go first and uh, I'll, I'll share my, um, uh, my money story. And again, this is a practice. This is constantly evolving. But let me just share my money story with you. Um, my, I am the, I am a later in life child. So I just turned 58. Um, my parents were born in the twenties and which seems like a really long time ago, but I don't mean, and I mean by that, I mean, 1920s, not 2020s. They were born in the 1920s. Um, uh, and, uh, they were children of the great depression and world war, uh, uh, world war two. Um, my, um, 
I, I know a lot less about my dad's thoughts and feelings than I do my mother's. Um, and I can tell you that my mother during the depression and World War II, her father owned a grocery store and they lived above the grocery store. And um, this was in Baltimore. And my mother was considered wealthy because she had food. <laughs> yeah. Although my her father and mother never saw themselves as wealthy or had money. They were very, very frugal. My mother, grew, having had her formative years during the depression, and I know there's a lot of you who can, who can relate to the to the depression era. And I do feel like we are still living so much of that trauma and how we think and feel about money because that was passed down from generation to generation because there were people who lost everything. Now, my mother, because of my grandfather's business, they wound up doing okay. And, and also my mother was an incredibly frugal person because you did not know, you did not know when it was all going to be taken away. So you have to save what you have. And she would, and I know there's so many like, um, like people like boomers and Gen X's and maybe even millennials that remember that silent gen and the basements full of food. Cause my mom, if corn was on sale, my mom's buying the corn. My mom would take a gallon of milk because we had five kids and she would make powdered milk and do half and half. Yikes. Um, my mom could stretch a dollar and, and, and we didn't have, we were not indulged. Um, we didn't eat out. Um, a Christmas, we had lovely holidays. We got a few things. There wasn't anything like super indulgent. That just, that's not who they were. My money, so then I rebelled against that because I saw the frugality of my parents and said, well, that doesn't look like fun. I'm going to do whatever I want. And the pendulum swung the other way. And I went, you know, and I rebelled against that mindset by spending and just sort of doing what I want with my money whenever I wanted. And, and neither one is right or wrong. This isn't about that. I'm just saying, and yet I was acting on the, I still was adopting my parents' mindset. I was just acting on it differently because I was rebelling against it. And I was like, wow, I have to really unpack that. And, and I have to tell you, like, we just had the holidays when my kids were little, my husband's family, they, they, they weren't spendy except at Christmas. Mom and dad went crazy at Christmas. And my husband loved to go crazy at Christmas because that was a big fond memory of him as a child. And I just remember when my kids were little and, you know, cause kids get bigger and the presents get smaller and more expensive and kids are little, they're big. So we have all these boxes and stuff and all this wrapped. And I'm like, Oh my, it's too much. Like it made my stomach hurt. This is too much. This is too indulgent. And my husband's like, what? It's fine. Because my mother, that mindset of like, Oh, it's too much. You can't indulge. It was like physically affecting me. Like, this is a physical thing. You know, if you meet somebody who has a tremendous amount of wealth and you could feel yourself getting nervous or uncomfortable. This is your money mindset at work. So you can step back and say, gee, what, what's happening here? You know, what, what, what's happening here? Why is this, why is this, why is this, huh? Why is this happening to me right now? What's going on? Once I'm conscious of how my thoughts and feelings are affecting my everyday decision-making around money, I can work to change it. So I want you to think about what's your money story? How did you grow up around money? How do you feel about fundraising? How do you feel about the people that you raise, that you ask for money? There can be a lot of resentment towards people with wealth when you want to ask them for something. It can make you feel vulnerable. It can make you feel um, um, you know, inadequate. And it, or it can make you, you know, resentful. There's a lot of stuff that can come up that can push away a relationship subconsciously, you not even knowing it. Let me share uh, a couple of things. I'm going to talk about specifically what I see are the biggest triggers in fundraising that come from our money mindsets. Um, first of all is fundraising is the worst because it doesn't feel fair. Our money mindset is that money must have an equal exchange. This is called market value. Market value means I'm going to go, I'm going to 
find shoes that I like. I'm going to pay for the shoes and I'm going to take those shoes with me. That is a fair transaction. Right? I order a pizza, I pay for the pizza, the pizza is delivered. That is a market value transaction. We want to see fundraising as a market value transaction. It's not, it's a social value transaction. And so it doesn't feel fair because you're giving me money. What are you getting for it? Good feelings, a thank you. That's not fair. That's not right. Because we're looking at it through our market value lens. If you look at the... The way to shift that is, first of all, understanding your money mindset beliefs, but also understanding that the greatest gift that we can ever give is our assets, our time, our money, our, our contribution. And when people give, they feel really, really good. And they are aligning their assets with their highest goals and ideals. And that is an amazing gift that you're giving to someone. And so just understanding that you're playing the market value game when this is a, in a social value space. That the people who give don't expect anything back for it. That Yeah, they expect to be thanked. They expect to feel a part of the community, but it's not an equal transaction. And that's what can really catch us up. Okay, the second is um, money. Money can be a trigger, right? Remember, our subconscious drives our money attitude in our money stories. And the biggest thing is that in nonprofit is we are mired in a scarcity. We believe, and I think this is culturally what we believe, but especially in the nonprofit space, that there's never enough or there will never be enough. And and we we tend to make decisions based on that. So for instance, let me give you a for instance. Now I'm working with a client and they're working on expressing themselves more authentically. And in that authentic expression, may talk about a program or a viewpoint or a mission um, or a movement that might not align with what a donor has, with what a donor wants. Well, I can't talk about that because what if they don't become a don't? What if they stop giving me money? So I stay quiet. And by staying quiet, I might even be per perpetuating the very problem that I'm trying to solve. But I stay quiet because I'm afraid that donor is going to leave. Where am I going to find another donor? Oh, no, I got to hold on to what I have. I got to hold on to that crummy board member that's totally checked out and and doesn't show for everything and probably would just love to be relieved of their duties because where am I going to get another one? And, and, and so we get mired in scarcity when an abundant mindset and an influential leader, like everything we do is rooted in abundance, knowing that I get to release what no longer serves me to make room for what does. I get to release the people who, you know, the 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 people who whose beliefs and values no longer align with our organization. That's okay. You let them go because now the people who will come are the ones who are truly aligned, who will stay with you. Their love is not conditional. And, and so that, that scarcity versus abundance is a big thing that we want to hold on to what we have. We want to hold on to the mailing list we have. Where are we going to find other people? And they haven't, you know, sent you any, they haven't done anything in five years to keep mailing to those people. They're not going to give, release them. Think about abundance. I am releasing these folks so that the people who um, are really, truly my people, I, I'm making room for them. Um, scarcity versus abundance. That's that's a big thing. So we talked about the market exchange. We're playing the wrong game, right? We're playing the market value and it's really a social value game. And we're mired in scarcity. And if we can shift to more abundant thinking, because here's the thing, there's enough for everyone. I believe the universe is limitless and abundant. I believe that there's enough out there for everyone. I believe that um, money's everywhere. We just have to attach ourselves to it. And when you can step into that, that's when the opportunities open up. Okay, here's another trigger. Asking for stuff. Asking us makes us feel insecure. Why? Because we 
we are being come into a vulnerable position where we're asking for help. Okay. We're asking for help and we have the possibility of rejection. That's the trifecta of fundraising. It's about money. It's about the vulnerability of asking for help. And it's about the uh, possibility that you could be rejected. <clears throat> That's a very powerful combination that would thwart most efforts. So if asking makes us insecure, what do we do? Grants, events, direct mail, anything that we can do so that we don't have to ask for anything we do. But what really moves people to action is the personal invitation. People don't give because they weren't, don't, weren't, people don't give because they weren't asked. And the reason they're not asked is because we are afraid of rejection. And we're afraid of the feelings that are going to come up when we ask somebody for money. And those feelings are so powerful. Let's just send them an email. Let's just do an event. You know, because the event feels more like a market transaction, which feels safer. Are you getting this? Are you with me? Are you hanging in? I would love to know what is coming up for you right now, because I'm sure some stuff is. And that's perfect. That's what we want. All right. Every year, um, I want to go back to scarcity for just one second. I, I call this the big lie. The big lie is that we were told there's so only so much money for philanthropy and you better get your slice of the pie. But if you look at data and giving, you know that that is not true. And there's no other industry in the world. And let's say, oh, there's only so much money in online giving or, or on um, in online uh, shopping. There, there are, there are, there's no other industry. This is where there's only so much money for philanthropy. That is not true. It's never been true. It's a lie that we tell ourselves. And that lie keeps us separate. It keeps us siloed. It keeps us from collaborating. It keeps us working in, you know, our, our donors, uh, our, uh, list close, you know, um, in, in the secret because, there's only so much for philanthropy. I have, I have to get my slice of the pie. And listen, I have to confess, I told this lie. I told this lie because somebody told me it was true and I believed it, all right? Um, so, you know, and, and, and if you look at anything like, oh, COVID, no one's giving in COVID. There was a 30%, what was it? 30% increase in giving during COVID. We can always make up stories about why people won't give. Oh, the economy. And, and those of us who've been in this game a long time, we, 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 we've seen everything. We've seen recession. We've seen housing crisis. We've seen wars. We've seen everything. It's not about the external. People give because they're asked. And that is just the bottom line. But we're afraid to ask because it triggers very complicated feelings around how we think and feel about money. And the way forward through that is to really understand those feelings, right? And, and then create new stories that serve you more effectively. So that's what we're going to talk about now. What are some new stories that we can replace than this old garbage that really isn't serving us? First of all, and number one, fundraising is a gift. It is how we show up our best. And when people give money, especially lots of money, they feel amazing. You know, respect your donors. Let them decide. When we say, oh, I don't think they can afford it, or it's not a good time, or there's a pandemic, I don't want to ask. You're making decisions for people. That, that is not how we practice influence, my friend. Let your donors decide. The more decision-making power you give other people, the more likely they are to decide what you want. I'm going to say that again. The more decision-making power you give other people in any aspect of life, the more they're going to decide what you want. But if you decide for them, they're going to get mad. Case in point, housing crisis, 2006, everybody cut their fundraising staff. Everybody cut their marketing staff. The donors were like, hey, where was this organization I was such a part of? And like, oh, we didn't want to ask you for money. Well, the donor said, all across the board, the survey said, the donor said, no, well, we have decide. And also, and just because I'm not able to give money at this time, that doesn't, now it's, I'm not valuable to you. I'm not part of a community. Remember, we want devotees, not donors. We want 
we want a relationship beyond that transactional giving. So yeah, they can give a lot more than money and then that keeps them around. And when they can give money again, they're going to give it to you. And so donors got really um, down because, or they just felt like they got booty called and now they didn't have any money and you weren't booty calling them anymore. So remember, fundraising is a gift. When we, when how we love our donors is to ask and let them decide and whatever they decide is totally okay. All right. Fundraising, when we ask people for money, it connects them to the two most powerful things in their life, their power and their purpose. Their power, meaning the assets they have, the gifts that they have, the money and the talent, whatever talent, treasure, time they can give, and their purpose, which is their legacy. What do they, what change do they want to see in the world? What, what you know, how do they, you know, what, um, what difference do they want to make? Those are also rooted in childhood. Not going to get into that, but if you go to my episode, The Philanthropic Heart, I go all into that. So we're attaching people to two amazing things, their power and their purpose. And when we're attached to those, we feel incredible. We make people happy. Giving money makes people happy. Okay. So if we look at it, it's, it's a gift. And when we respect our donors, we let people aside. And we're here to just make people happy. Attach their assets to their highest beliefs and values. What a beautiful way to connect with someone. So talk about this. How can you retrain your brain? First of all, let's get let let's 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 inventory your stories. What are the thoughts and feelings you have around money? Where did those thoughts and feelings come from? How well are those thoughts and feelings serving you in your fundraising world? And then what new stories can I create to retrain my thinking and help me to create a better perspective, a better thought process, a better money mindset so that I can be more effective and raise more money. One of the things that really helped me is understanding the ebb and flow of money. Money is not a stagnant pond. There's an ebb and flow to it. If we look at money like a stagnant pond, it will go like that stagnant. When I have the courage to like invest in my business, flow money out, that means I'm allowing money to come in. Um, so that's one of the things that like really helped me because like my mother, what I, you know, what my body, my whole body was wired to do was to save, but I was acting in opposition to that, right. In, in re rebellion to my mother, I, but I really wanted, you know, to save. It's like, Oh, I got to hold on to this. I got to hold on to this. Cause that's what I learned from my mom. But I realized money is a flow and when you flow it out, it can flow in. That's a great story. So, you know, so there's a lot of ways that you can retrain your story. So for instance, like if you feel resentful towards people who have money, you know, one of the things that you can say to yourself is money is a tool. Money doesn't solve problems. Um, money is a tool to help people solve problems, but actually people solve problems. And money is the one of the tools that we use to do that. And, you know, and just how can I neutralize money? And I have really worked hard, especially around in very wealthy people to really neutralize that. I had a friend who won the lottery actually, and she was worth many, many millions of dollars. And I had done so much money mindset work. It, it didn't really affect me, but I know, but it affected a lot of her relationships. People grew to resent her. She lost friends. She lost family members because she had, you know, because like, oh, why aren't you paying her? How come you're not going to give that to me? And, and she set pretty good boundaries around her money and, um, she lost, she lost friends for that. You can be, it could be easy to just like, oh yeah, sure. I'll give you the money. Cause you, you want your friends, you want your family. Um, it, you know, so I really unpack that and I can see money very neutrally. Like some people have it, some people don't, but that's not for, you know, and I know that those people who they may be more comfortable, but they're no more happier. Um, and I know that even those people who have money, they don't think they have enough. No one ever, I, I, I swear to you, you could have millions and millions and you say, wait, wait, I, I'm not I, I, another million. And then I'll feel secure because you're looking at the money to create security. When actually I create the security, I create the security inside of me. I create that sovereignty. It, whatever my checkbook says or doesn't say that doesn't matter because I'm sovereign. And that's coming from inside of me. That's a big shift. So think about that. Think about your money stories. Think about how these stories affect your thoughts and feelings around how you ask for money, 
your relationship with your donors. And then we can, you can re reframe those stories. And this is what my training does. It helps us understand how our brain works and create stories that um, serve us more effectively so that we can retrain our brain so that it's working for us, not against us. And that is really like, if you want the nutshell of what I do, because that's what I was not, no one was addressing that in the industry. Like, oh, just say this, do that. And people are like, but that fills me with fear. Oh, well, you, can, you can get over that. Okay, yes, you can. And I'm gonna, I can show you how so that you can really open up. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this one thing. I work with a coach, his name's Dr. Aaron Wilkerson. If you follow me, I've, I've mentioned it before. And he does this thing called entrainment and I'm not even, I can't even explain it. It's just this, it's just, it looks crazy, but may, anyway, doesn't matter. It, it's on a chiropractic table and I'm laying on the table and he comes up to me and he says, the next phase of your life is about allowing people to do things for you and receiving your next phase of your life. You, you, you put all you can into the world. It's your turn to receive. And I'm like, well, this sounds really good. <laughs> I could do this. And so I am working on opening up my receptivity, allowing people to do things for me, allowing good things to come to me. And until you switch it, like I didn't realize how much I was blocking it. Tiny little thing, but it's a big thing. Um, I host Thanksgiving. My sister said, hey, we're not doing anything the day after. We can come over and help you guys put tables and chairs away. Oh, no, no, we got it. As I'm putting tables and chairs away myself, like, what was I doing? Allow people to do something for you. Allow things to happen for you. Allow the wealth to flow to you. Allow the love, the joy, all of that, because it's all tied together. It's all about our ability to receive goodness, because if we don't feel worthy of it, we will push it away. You're like, that sounds so crazy. Why would I push money away? My whole job is to go find money. I know that is sound, does sound crazy. And it's true. And you could be subconsciously without even really knowing it, being pushing people, relationships, money away from you that will serve you because you don't feel worthy of it. So we're going to switch all that. Okay. You want to talk more about this? You can go to uh, courageouscommunication.com forward slash connect. The link is in the show notes. You can book a call with me and we can talk more about all of this because this is some supercharged stuff. Okay. And, and I've promised you with, with attention, with knowledge and with practice, you can shift and you'll be more confident, more excited, and you will have way better relationships with your donors because you don't need them, right? You're choosing them and they're choosing you. And that energy of choice becomes so powerful. You lose that sense of desperation and fear and panic, and you can ride the world with confidence and ease. I promise you that is true. Okay, that's it for me in this uh, episode of the Influential Nonprofit. I uh, love you and, um, you know, just reach out if you need anything and I will see you next time.